Okay, couple quick updates. We are going to, um, I will send out the weekly email a little bit later this afternoon. Thank you for your patience on that. Um, this week we have uh, switched up the growth mastermind. I'm just testing a different time to see if we can get a little bit better of a turnout. I'm gonna um, do that on 11 o'clock on Thursday. 11 o'clock on Thursday will be the growth mastermind. We do have a number of uh, really good events this week at the Market Center. One, um, let me make sure I'm reading this stuff to you properly. Um, hang on. All right, somebody help me out here. There's a, um, Sarah Sloan is doing a um, 36 touch class today, is that right? Yes, it's today from 10 to 1130. That's what I thought. Okay, 10 to 1130 today. Sarah Sloan, who is our number two agent, is going to be um, teaching a class on the 36 touch. Um, I highly recommend that you participate in that. Um, that will be on the Keller White or KW Roswell training page. And if you do it during what is normally lead generation time, please remember um, to, to find a different time to lead generate. Okay. Um, I also want to remind you guys that if, well, please, it goes without saying, please go ahead and, and put in the numbers for the first week in February so we don't get behind. Um, I put a link to make it super easy in the announcements page. Um, and that'll be for the first week, the first through the seventh and set your goals for the second week. Now I will remind you the third week is family reunion and we have a shorter month than normal. Okay. So I honestly, you know, very transparently, um, will probably not do nearly as much lead generation next week as I normally do. And I'm assuming that if you guys dive into family reunion, you probably won't either. So don't find yourself at the end of next week saying to yourself, oh my gosh, it's family reunion, I forgot, and now I'm way behind in my goals. Let's take some extra time and effort this week to make sure that we don't feel that way. Okay, let's push down the gas just a little, little harder this week so that we can feel good going into family reunion rather than um, feel the need to miss events for family reunion because you're playing catch up. Fair enough? Okay, okay. Yes. Any questions on any of that? All right. All right, I'm gonna make a quick comment. I, um, I thought about something a, a, a pretty insane amount this weekend. And um, I wanna clarify something I said Friday. Um, hey, Mel. I want to clarify something I said on Friday. I, I, I got I, I let my emotions get the best of me, and I um, implied that I didn't think, or maybe I, I don't know if people took it this way. Um, I just want to make a quick note on Key Please. Okay, um, Key Please is a wonderful service. Um, as I understand it, there are the agents that would like uh, to find a match can set their price. Um, and I implied that I didn't think $25 uh, per job was enough. And I kind of still think that way. I do still think that way, but that's not a negative commentary on the product itself, okay? Everyone here is able to make whatever decisions they want, whether they want to take advantage of an opportunity like that. Um, and I totally respect that. With that said, um, it, it is not a harsh commentary on key please. It is a slightly less than harsh commentary on um, expecting somebody to do it for $25. Is that fair? Very fair. Okay. Um, yeah, Bill, I, I, I didn't take it as a judgment. I didn't take it a judgment on us or anything. I didn't take it as a judgment. There's, there's your opinion. I appreciate it. And no, I didn't think it anything. Uh, and I think it's, I think it's good to get the, the opinion of people who are, have been in the business. So I thought it was helpful. Yeah. I, and I appreciate you guys saying that. I think I didn't want to imply that. Um, uh, let me think about, I want to say this. I, I didn't want anyone to feel uh, judged if they took a $25 opportunity. Right. First of all, 
And um, my my commentary was in an effort to, it was almost like a um, like a, a silent refusal, right? And not 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 a commentary on the product itself. It was a let's see if we can't push for a little bit more. You see what I'm saying? Because even if you don't have work right the second, even if you're you're aching for the cash. Your, bet, your return is probably stronger, honestly, if you go out and hit the phones rather than take $25 to drive all over town to drop off a sign. Fair enough? Yeah, the way I took it, Bill, was you were telling us to, um, you know, to value our time and it's up to us to determine how, how we do that. You know, okay. and if, I didn't yeah. take any offense or think that it was, um, you know, a knock against key please at all. Okay, good. I didn't either. I, I, I didn't take or, it that way or, at all. Or a knock on us if we accepted the money or what have you. No, I didn't take it out that way at all either. Right. Okay, perfect. So thank you for, for uh, letting me share that this morning. Um, does anyone have any news that they'd like to share uh, before we go into how to win a multiple offer? I know a bunch of you guys have been yep, going I, on a plane left and right. It's pretty exciting. Hey, uh, Bill, it's Janice. Hey, so yeah. I had sent out Christmas cards and I've been following up over the last couple of weeks and um, someone I hadn't heard from since September and had been pursuing leaving messages, email, that type of thing, not like stalking, but, you know, just keeping in contact. Remarkably, when I was talking to someone else that I also hadn't heard of, heard from in a long time she tried to call and um anyway all I'm getting at is don't give up you know my sometimes people take a long time to respond and um now things are moving and so you know just don't give up beautiful beautiful love that Janice great job okay anyone else uh Gre Greta made a um used one of our our famous lines in here over the weekend you want to share share about the um here's what happens next line Greta yeah, I was talking with, I went on the listing presentation and um, I was talking, I realized that it was, she wasn't going to list, right? She, she wanted to stay where she was, but I talked to her about converting into maybe buying an investment property. And I said, here's what I'm going to do next. Here's what we're going to do next. And that led into going to get a pre-qualified or for um, another mortgage and I'm going to set her up on a couple of searches once we know what we're working with. And she seemed really pleased with that. Beautiful. It's always like, even if there doesn't seem to be uh, like what, what's going to happen next, if you use that phrase, then it, keep, it keeps the relationship ongoing. Here's what's going to happen next. I'm going to send you this each month. Even if it's something like that, um, it it kind of encourages them to think of this as an ongoing relationship rather than a, a you know, a one-time thing where if the paperwork isn't signed, it's kind of over. Does that make sense? I think it also, um, for some people, it also makes you feel like I'm doing business. I'm an yeah. investor. I'm important. And I've got stuff going on in my life, which is kind of nice right now too. Are you talking about for you or for them? For both. Yeah, I, that's what I was going to say. I thought you were going to say one or the other, but yeah. it's actually like, it, it's even maybe more so for the prospect because they're like, here's this professional realtor that's probably got lots of things going on and she wants to stay in touch with me. That's kind of cool, right? I must be worthwhile. I love that. Great idea there. I didn't think about it that way. Great idea. Okay, let's do one more. Who else has some good news? All right. Well, I, All right, I did my first um, lease for um, for an owner, and that was an experience having to prepare a lease and that whole package um, this weekend for a, an owner who's leasing, who's taking her primary home and turning it into an investment property. So I thought that was a good experience for me. Beautiful. Another tool that I have now to offer, um, you know, sellers that maybe can't sell right now. Yeah, that was my uh, go-to, and that, that was pretty much one of the most pivotal parts of my business was 
back in 2007, 2008, for example, I didn't have any problem getting the listing appointment. What I had a problem with was coming to a price, which is I'd walk in the door and say, hey, all the data looks like you should sell this home for 250. And they're like, get the hell out of here. Right. I'm like, no, 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 just kidding. What, what did I do wrong? And they're like, no, we like you, but we ain't selling for 250. We bought it for 325. Right. I'm like, well, I don't know what to tell you, but there ain't nobody buying it for 325 anymore. Right. So what can I do to help? And what happened is we became default landlords, not me, but I, I started representing them. And it, and I just went like a lot of people went in the short sale direction. That's the direction I went in is I'm going to go find all these people who like me and just can't sell right this second. And at one point we had, I had over 30 people that I was helping every year, every two years finding a tenant. And I got a, thousands of rental leads from that. Right. Yeah, I was going to, I was going to say that because there aren't a lot of houses on the market for sale. There are a lot of people looking um, still looking for like places to lease. So I did get some leads um, just from people who came to look at it, um, but were not selected to, to rent it. Right. Or they ended up, um, you know, maybe they went to an apartment or, you know, they found something that a friend had or whatever it is. Now, you know, that there's, you have a relationship or a potential relationship with another resident of Metro Atlanta who doesn't have a relationship with a real estate agent, right? That's the whole point, right? And then I would, I literally had hundreds of people on like an Excel, Excel spreadsheet and I had the date that their lease expired and I sorted the list that way. And every month I had another 15 or 20 people whose lease was expiring. So months mm -hmm. ahead of time, I was calling those people, getting them pre-qualified, some moved somewhere else, some didn't move, some bought, et cetera. So like um, uh, Ashley the other day had a, um, a rental down in a rental listing down in Bucket. And it's like a $2,000 a month place. If you can afford $2,000 a month, you're like a $400,000 buyer at some point. So these are very, very valuable relationships. You see what I'm saying? Yeah, I do have one question, Bill. Yeah. We are not allowed to manage property for, um, for owners. Is that correct? Uh, the, the blanket answer to that would be yes, there are certain circumstances where it could be allowed. For example, if you were a broker and you have your own uh, property management brokerage and there are some, uh, there is a little bit of gray area, but definitely if you are not a broker and definitely if you don't have your own brokerage or you know property management brokerage, the answer to that would be no. Okay, thank you. Okay, and then just as a reminder, we are as just as we're able to represent home buyers and home sellers, we're also able to help landlords in the marketing and, and leasing of their property uh, and be paid. Typically, the first month's rent is the payment. Um, and if there is a real estate agent that represents the tenant in that in that um, transaction, then generally you as the listing broker are going to share a portion of your commission, the first month's rent with that person. Generally, you see that somewhere in the neighborhood of around 25 to 30% typically, okay? So again, we can represent landlords uh, finding a tenant and we can represent uh, tenants finding a landlord. Make sense? Hey, Bill, can we do a session on how the process works? Yeah, morning? yeah absolutely, absolutely. Um, yeah, uh, I will make a note of that right now. Well, I wanted to tell the new agents, my very first deal at uh, Keller Williams was someone looking to lease a home and they were transferring from Connecticut. He was a doctor at the CDC. I am still in contact with them. They are still leasing. Um, and just to tell you, they had some businesses that went belly up. And so they've just recently paid those off, paid their debts off. And now they're looking for a house. So, you know, it, he pays like almost 3000 a month for this house on a lake. Um, I can't think of a subdivision, but Veronica Bird, she's, she's the one that uh, is at, big in that area. Yeah, at so some don't... point, somebody that can afford a $3,000 a month right. lease will become a buyer. It's just a yeah. matter of time. And checking in with them periodically to offer your support and to answer any questions and let them know you're thinking about them is very, 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 very worthwhile. Okay. 
remember, um, I mean, I, I literally, if I took my database and I went and looked at the origin of everyone in there, I would be willing to bet that at least 60% of the database came from one of three properties. A little house over in uh, uh, Marietta, a little house in Alpharetta, and a little house over in um, uh, kind of North Lake Mall area. I mean, it, it, ha it has the potential to be incredibly, incredibly powerful. Okay, let's talk about multiple offers for a second. Um, a lot of what we've talked about, I'm, I'm, we've talked about, or a lot of what we will talk about, we've mentioned before, but I'm going to try to sum it up for you guys really nicely, okay? Now, um, the one, the first priority um, in winning a multiple offer situation, in my personal opinion, is making sure that you and your client have a very clear understanding of how to be successful in the market in general, okay? So the couple of presuppositions are the buyer has been educated, right? And the education is likely gonna come in the form of a home buyer seminar or a buyer consultation, right? So during the buyer consultation, not only are we asking the buyer, you know, how do I win with you? How do I lose with you? What's most important? Why is that most important? How do we make sure this is a 10 plus experience and all that kind of stuff and give them a chance to talk? Remember, we are the ones that have to set the expectations. So there's a couple of chart master slides, which we've discussed that I think are really important to show a buyer. Number one, the, the slide about the, um, what we call the game board slide, which is that the slide that says like of 100 closed sales, this many never sold, this many did sell. And of the ones that did sell, this is the percentage that sold after a reduction in price. This is the percentage that sold uh, without a reduction in price. So if a home goes under contract without having a, the price reduced, it's gonna sell you know, pretty much right at 100% in like six days. So if a brand new listing comes on the market and, you, and they've already got multiple offers, chances of you getting anything that resembles a deal is not gonna happen, right? You're gonna be fighting tooth and nail for that property with other sellers, or I'm sorry, with other buyers, make sense? So the first understanding is um, how, how does the buyer become successful in the market? The other really important chart master slide to mention is the one where it says, what percentage of sales occur at listing price or above listing price, right? Um, that will show them, hey, I'm in a price range, for example, where nearly half of the properties are selling at or above list price. So if there's a good chance that if I'm attracted to a particular property, I'm not the only one. Make sense? Another good slide for a buyer to see from Chartmasters is the slide where it shows the months of supply in their price range and how that has changed over time. So the greatest part about, win, or the, the way to set yourself up to win in the multiple offer situation, as crazy as it sounds, is to have a really good buyer, right? And what I mean by good buyer is they're, they, they're, they understand how to be successful in the market, they understand what market they're in, and that they are, they're willing to you know, follow your recommendations, so to speak. If I say, hey, Michael, we're going to have to go in at list price or you know, above list price or not ask for home warranty and not ask for a termite bond and not ask for a, you know, closing cost. And he's like, well, I want to buy the home for 65% of list price and ask for, you know, uh, all my closing costs. Like that's not a quality buyer. That's somebody who's not paying attention at all. Does that make sense? Okay. So the first is to get an educated buyer and you're in charge of the education. The second is to make sure that they are working with a lender that you trust or at least is showing you the signs that they're trustworthy, right? Meaning like if let's say Michael has a buyer and the buyer wants to use his own lender or somebody at his bank or something, um, I, you know, I can't steer them to work with Kathy or somebody else. I could certainly recommend it, but I can also share with the buyer, hey, Michael, um, your, your lender, Steve, um, it's been three days since I asked for something and I haven't heard back from him. I gotta be honest with you, it's not looking good. Okay, that, that level of communication is not acceptable. Okay, because today we don't have any deadlines and this is the way he's behaving or she's behaving. Wait till we have deadlines, it's gonna get ugly. Okay, we're gonna miss stuff. You're gonna put yourself at risk. You're gonna put your earnest money at risk. You're gonna put this house at risk. 
So I want to make sure that we have a real tight relationship with the lender and that they're being responsive. Remember, the other thing that I believe is um, important is that they are willing to provide something called a loan worksheet. They may have different terms for this, but a, a, basically a loan worksheet is uh, an explanation of, it's a line, line item by line item explanation of what the fees are for buying the property, closing costs, and what the fees are for um, financing the property, which are related to escrows and uh, title insurance and that kind of stuff. That way, when I'm out on the weekend showing these properties, they, uh, I can do some quick math to determine, okay, well, the, you know, instead of the taxes being 2,800, they're only 2,300, and I can, you know, kind of determine what the tax amount will be and the escrows will be, and therefore what the closing costs will be. If I don't know what type of loan my guy is getting, or I don't know what type of down payment they're getting, or I don't have a closing cost estimate, I'm basically completely shooting in the dark. And so if I ask for $6,500 in closing costs, and I actually only need 4,500, then number one, I'm causing my buyer a, a likelihood that he may not win the multiple offer and um, that we would be asking for more than we actually need, okay? So it's really important to understand we don't wanna ask for too much and we don't wanna ask for not a lot, not enough. I'm talking about closing costs in particular. So those are the two first things to consider is we want a well-educated buyer who's cooperative and who's working with a lender that we um, are enjoying the experience of working with. Any questions so far? I have a question. Okay. So when I put an offer in, um, I, and this is just not knowing, um, like my buyer that I'm working with has the ability to purchase a big home, but he's choosing to use about half of his purchase power yep. to buy this home. How do I get Which that the pre in there? say? Yeah. How do I get that in there without going, oh, he could, you know. Um, well, so there is a difference between somebody who can afford more and somebody who's willing to pay more, mm -hmm. right? So that, that, that would be my first comment. Let's say, for example, he's buying a home for three fifty, dollars and he can afford a $600,000 home or something, mm -hmm. right? I would probably have the, um, the what do you call it, the uh, pre-approval pre letter say something like three seventy five dollars or 400 or something like that, right? Okay. So it doesn't have to like go down to like the nickel. Because people could look at it two different ways. They could say, oh, he's submitting an offer for 350. The pre-approval says 350. Um, is he like, is he tight at 350 or is he well qualified at 350? So a seller could look at that and say, I wonder if that's all he's got. Right. And you're you on the other side is reluctant to say 360 because he's submitting an offer for 350. So I personally, I think there's too much weight given to that. Um, uh, I personally think that if you submit a, a pre-qualification letter that is a hair higher than the, the numbers you guys are at, I think that's totally acceptable. And whether the guy can afford more or not, that's his business. That doesn't necessarily mean he's willing to pay more, right? You follow that? Okay. Now, with that said, um, I, I'll tell you though, Greta, you ask 100 agents and they're going to give you 100 different answers. Not, not to give you, <laughs> it's just a lot of times that's the way that it, that it works out. Um, okay, so let's go back to um, the, the pre-approval. Okay, so now we have a pre-approval in our hand. We have a loan worksheet in our hand and we, we are now looking at property, right? Now remember, you are beginning your negotiation the second you start talking to the other side or the second you start doing stuff in their world, even if it's like setting up a showing time or texting them, letting them know that, you know, you've left the home and the, the cat didn't get out or that the alarm's back on or any of that kind of thing, right? So remember, one of the keys to being a good negotiator is to be nice, right? Just to be a pleasure to work with. Everyone is looking, everyone, every buyer, every seller, every agent, everyone is looking for a way to make the process as simple and easy as possible. Your job as a real estate agent should be, how do I make this simple and easy for everyone I'm working with, right? Does that going to require that you do more than your job description, so to speak? Yeah, most likely it is, okay? But you will become, you will get an, uh, um, a reputation for going out of your way to be helpful. And do you know who people like working with? 
people who are willing to go out of their way to be helpful. If you're snooty on the phone, you don't return phone calls, right? You, you don't listen to instructions. You're, you're not going to stand out. It, well, you may stand out, but it's not going to be to get your offer accepted. Ever follow that? Okay, the next step is we got to know what these people want, right? So let's assume you've, be, you've uh, been super cooperative and you, you've um, you know, been super respectful and you've gone to the home and your buyer's ready to move forward with it, okay? So the next thing we need to do is we want to go back to the listing agent and we can say, um, hey, you know, it's uh, Steve, it's Bill Linkwald. I, I'm working with a super well-qualified um, uh, buyer and we are going to be preparing an offer for 123 Hill Street. I just had a couple of questions for you. Um, can you share, is there anything that you could share with me um, that your seller is particularly interested in? What is most important to your seller? Okay, more often than not, they're gonna say the most money, the least closing cost, the least little knick-knacky requests and that kind of stuff, right? Keep the offer nice and clean. Um, periodically though, they will say something like, we wanna close on this day or we wanna close with this attorney, or we want to pay no closing costs, or we want um, to keep uh, all the flat screens in the house or something like that, right? They may have a slight, I don't wanna say slightly unusual request, but they get a specific request, okay? Now keep in mind, just because they request it doesn't mean that you have to give it, but at least you're learning how to present your offer in the best light. So I hear all the things that I've heard and I go back to my buyer and say, hey, Michael, if you'd like to win or you want a better shot at winning, let's concede on these things right here, okay? Ideally, we wanna submit an offer with as little closing cost as possible. I know that's not always possible. I totally get that. There are a couple of ways that you can overcome, overcome that, that situation. One is by inflating the price to offset the closing cost. So for example, let's say somebody's buying a $300,000 home and the closing costs are eight grand, you could offer 308 and eight grand in closing cost. Okay, that's one way. Oftentimes that doesn't work very well in a multiple offer situation because now you've created two problems. The first is now instead of having a 300,000 appraisal threshold, now you have a $308,000 threshold that needs to be achieved or needs to be um, met, okay? And um, you're competing against other people who may not be asking for closing costs. Another way to do it, which quite frankly, isn't that awesome for a buyer, the buyer has to think of winning as getting the property, right? Um, I, I, let me come back to that. So um, uh, basically you could go to the lender and say, hey, instead of quoting me at 3% interest rate and 7,000 in closing cost. Can you, per, can you quote me at three and a quarter interest rate and 2,500 in closing cost? So as you move the interest rate up, the closing cost goes down, okay? So sometimes that is a way to um, present an offer with less closing cost request. Um, now, of course, you have to be able to afford the home at that um, higher interest rate, make sense? So you want to work with a, a lender who's willing to like come try to strategize with you. Like, hey, show me some options here. What can we do so that my buyer presents himself in a better light? The loan worksheet is going to come from the lender directly. Hey, send me a loan worksheet on a 10% down conventional if that's what my buyer is, if that's what our, our buyer is looking at, right? And then you have a uh, basically an itemized list of all the costs that are going to be associated with buying the home and getting financing to buy the home and establishing the escrow accounts. Okay, so we have now have learned what's important to the seller. Okay, we've been polite and kind and giving the whole time. We've shared that information with the buyer. We've come up with some strategies to make our offer look more attractive. By the way, um, I'm not saying don't, I'm not saying a warranty is not important. I'm saying that it's that kind of stuff that causes your offer not to be as appealing, right? When you let, when you start littering it with, you know, every issue that's ever gone wrong in a transaction for you. Okay, and multiple offers, they want to see nice clean contracts. The buyer can buy the home warranty on their own if, they're in, if it's important to them. 
If I know I'm in a multiple offer situation, we're not ask, we're not asking for home warranties. Okay, buyer can still buy it. Um, I just don't want to lose a deal over five or six hundred bucks. Make sense? And here, did you have a question? I just saw your your. No, I don't. I'm sorry. Up. I just okay. joined it. I just saw your uh, your your square light up. That's why I asked. Okay. Um, Another thing that we can do when we are uh, presenting the offer is uh, an intro letter, right? Hey, our, our family is, you know, they love the, the backyard. They're gonna be doing so much entertaining. And, you know, the, the children's rooms are painted the perfect color. And, you know, I, I uh, love the gourmet kitchen. You know, my husband's a chef, whatever it is to get them to look at your offer with some more emotion rather than just the simple, numbers okay um uh let's see and i always like in my intro email like when i'm attaching everything um to point out some of the things that like for example if the listing agent said no closing cost and close with you know prior law group then in my note to them in my email to them i said as requested I know how important it is for your seller to close this transaction at Friar Law Group. So we have put Flyer, Friar Law Group on the uh, page. Or, hey, you know, I know you said it was multiple offers. We have decided to increase our earnest money to 2% instead of what you might be expecting closer to 1%, right? So anything that I'm conceding or I want to uh, draw attention to, I'm making note of that in the, in the body of the email that I send it out. And then hopefully it goes without saying, but I'll say it anyway, is you are being judged by the offer that you submit, right? So for example, if you've got mislabeled, you know, exhibits and, you know, something was left unsigned and the pages are out of order, or, you know, you forget to include certain things, like that's just, it, it's sloppy. And, and as a result, they, they, you can say all day long, hey, I want to make this easy for you. But if you submit a sloppy offer, you're not showing that to be true. <laughs> Does that make sense? Yes. Okay, beautiful. What questions do we have? So when I have your buyers do like a generic um, letter, like to the, um, like if they're looking to purchase a home, should they always have a generic letter? you know, just to send, like you said, that we can do like an intro, like a starter email or something like that. Should we have buyers do the same thing? Um, you're asking, wait, you're asking if the buyer, you're, if the buyer should write the note? Yeah, that's what we were talking about. Did I miss yeah. it? Yeah, but I thought you, I thought we were doing an email, like as the agent. Yeah. So we do kind of like an intro and then the buyer, they do there, they should have like a generic one for everything that they want to submit. You know, so like, let's yeah, just say so that they, they have four homes that they're looking at. Should they do kind of like a, you know, just a letter for each one of those homes as an intro. And then like, when we're getting them, we let them know like, hey, this is something, this is kind of like a requirement the same way you're, su you're submitting, you know, paperwork to the lender on the other side of the transaction, just as important as the lender is, the person who's listing the home, you know, to make them stand out. So should they always do an additional letter for each home that they're looking at? Well, I wouldn't have them write the letter until it's time to submit the offer. So it'd be unlikely that they'd have to write four at one time, right? So whatever one they like the most, that's the one they can write a letter on. Hey, Bill, I wanted to say that um, I, I usually write the letter for my buyers. And I've had many people say that letter was the make or break decision on whether to sell to my buyers. So I think it's really important. Um, I share it with my buyers, but I think the making it personal and exact for that home is really important. Right? I think it's a, a real key hey, Janice, piece. Let me ask you yeah. something. When you write those letters, do you write it in as if you are the buyer or you, you're just basically yeah. telling telling no, them? I, I, say, I say my buyer is um, more excited, is so excited to buy your home because it's a perfect fit for them. We've been looking for two months. They have two kids. The swings in the back will be perfect. You know, I really right. personalize 
uh, I write it and um, just talk about my buyer and what great people they are. Yeah, I, I, don't, I think that strategy is fine. And I think the strategy of the buyer um, writing it is also fine. Um, and well, I've done both. I actually submit two letters, one from me and one from my buyer. Right. And on um, both of the transactions that, I, that I've had, um, the seller pointed out that the letter is, well, actually three. One, one we um, canceled, but all three, they said the letters were what made them select my buyer. It's interesting what emotions will make you do, right? They'll make you leave money on the table sometimes. Um, uh, Corey, what did you want to say? Uh, yeah, um, <clears throat> same thing for the offer that um, that I put in for my buyers last weekend. Um, that was the that was what caused them to uh, lean towards my offer as opposed to one that they were leaning towards. It was a cash offer with all of the terms that they were looking for. And we had most of the terms that they were looking for. Um, but um, I, I had a sense for how to appeal to the, the seller um, in part because I knew actually knew the buyer or the seller. Um, and so I, I told them, I said uh, to include a photo and, um, and, and they wrote it, I told them to write it. And I think it's, you know, to what, what Janice was saying, it's really important to, um, you know, to review what they wrote, because if they're, you know, if, if they're not the best writer, then you need to yeah. be prepared to write it or, um, you know, because actually the, the other agent asked me, she said, did you write this? Because this is like, she thought it was really well written and she wasn't sure that the buyer, the buyers actually submitted it. And, um, and I said, no, no. I said, all I did is I added a date and I added um, their pictures on the back or on the second page. So, you know, if they're good writers and they know how to appeal, um, if they take your direction well, then, you know, great. But if not, then I think it's good to, um, you could actually write it from first person. You can, you know, you could, and just, make sure that they're okay with it. Yeah, the, the only thing that I would, um, I don't know how Melba would think about this. I think she would agree with me. Um, once you start getting into like pictures, that's a whole different discussion now. I don't think I would probably submit a picture because um, pictures can reveal things that are protected classes, right? Let's say it's two mm -hmm. wives with the kids or two husbands with the kids or they're wide or not wide or something like that mm -hmm. and then you could say oh well you know we had two two mothers uh and that's why we chose not to sell to you or something like that and that can get really ugly really fast mm -hmm. so i would be cautioned that's the only thing i would caution you on that makes sense um yeah well with this particular one um i knew that the seller had a um a penchant for style and fashion and the, the buyer uh, was exhibiting that. Um, and so I knew that that would be something that would be appealing. So, but I, I can appreciate what you're saying. Yeah, cool. Um, Bill, does the uh, escalation clause apply here? Yeah, I'm glad. I felt like I was missing something and that's, that's, that's one thing. Let me talk about that for just a second. Um, <clears throat> So there's an, there's a, here's what an escalation clause is. An escalation clause, oh, there's really two other things I wanna mention. So one is an escalation clause. An escalation clause would be something that you'd put in the special stipulations that would say something to the effect of, um, my buyer will pay, um, let's say $1,500 more than your highest net offer. Right, there's some language of exactly how that would read in the in the Google Drive. We've got a couple of exam samples of that. Um, and let's say, for example, that the, the home was listed for 300, and you got the seller got an offer for 290, 295, 296, 298, 306, and then your offer was let's say 300, but it said I'll pay 1,500 dollars more than the highest other offer you get. So, but you have to show it to me or show me the front page, then you, you potentially win, or at least your offer is now 3075 and is judged next to the other ones. So it's kind of like, you know, the, the, the price is right where you would say like, you know, $1 over, that's kind of that version. 
Now, what happens when you have multiple escalation clauses? That can also get hairy, but as a buyer, you, you can't really, that's not up to you. All you can do is put it out there. The only thing that you could do to, to make your offer stand out from the other one is uh, to go to have a higher difference. So instead of saying like, I'll go $500 higher than the other offer, maybe you say, I'll go five grand higher than the other offer, okay? Um, that doesn't necessarily guarantee that you win though, as we've proven, because some people will accept a lower offer because they feel emotionally attached to the person that wants to buy it, right? So the uh, um, escalation clause is a is a way to, um, uh, uh, to to make your offer stand out and to kind of automatically put it up. Now, some people will say, should I put a cap, right? So my my buyer will go up to fifteen hundred dollars higher, up to three fifteen. So that's what I used to do. And then I was, uh, somebody gave me some feedback on that and I stopped doing that. And the reason is, is because I just, you know, a seller could just say, Hey, um, I know you're willing to pay 315 now. So unless you pay 315, you don't win. Right. Mm -hmm. And the seller or that buyer could, could say yes or no, but now I might not be willing to sell it for 3075. If I know you're willing to pay 315 for it, I'll just tell you, Hey, I don't, I don't care about the other offer. I want 315 from you. And if you're not willing to give me 315, I'm going to sell it to somebody different, right? So there's no, there's no rule that says you have to sell it to the person that is giving you the most money, right? Hey, Bill. Bill? Yes, ma'am. Or yes, sir. Uh, if you ask the other agent, the seller's agent, if there is an escalation clause, will they tell you? And maybe for how much will they share that with you? Um, the likelihood of them telling you how much is virtually zero. Uh, the likelihood of them telling you that they have an escalation clause, maybe. Um, you got to understand, there's a lot of people that have fallen their way into a listing and don't know how to protect their client. So I, I'm not, I would encourage you to ask, hey, is there anything you can tell me about the other offers? And that's very open-ended and vague. And an inexperienced agent might say, yeah, the best one's 312. Whew, all right, thank you. Got all I need. Right. Where a experienced agent would say, nice try, Bill. Right. Or oh. an experienced agent would say, oh, I see you've been in the business 15 years. This is a clean contract. Why don't you give me 314 and we got a deal? Right. So it's sometimes you, like I've mentioned to you guys several times, like, there's agents, there's a bunch of agents in Metro Atlanta now where if I, I have the buyer and they have the listing, I just have to call the agent and be like, hey, it's Bill, um, what is it going to take? And they're like, oh my gosh, I want to do a deal with you. You're so easy to work with. Everything's nice and buttoned up. I'll, you'll do your job and probably half of mine. Let's do it, right? So, hey Bill, um, what? Sorry, so that's why your previous statement about making sure you have all your I's dotted and your T's crossed and everything's organized and doing your intro email is so important because you build relationships with other agents and they know whether to respect you, whether you're, you know, you're not going to bring a, you know, poorly qualified buyer. So those are all connected. So, yeah. Because yeah, at the end of the day, the listing agent is looking at this and saying, who am I going to have to drag this guy to the closing table because they have no idea what they're doing? Or is this going to be simple? Right. Remember, we're trying to make it easy on all the all the other people involved. Okay. All right. Um, I'm going to mention one other thing, although this is probably going to open up a, a whole nother can of worms, which is there is a um, a line that has been in the contract for a while, and I'm just starting to see that it's being used, which is the line at right below where it talks about on page one, right below where it talks about the due diligence period. It talks about option money. Okay. So that is separate from earnest money, okay? As we know, earnest money is generally around 1%. It is negotiable, it doesn't have to be 1%, but more often than not, you see it hovering right around 1% of the sales price, okay? If you want your offer to stand out, you could put more money, more earnest money up, okay? 1% is, is very low in comparison to what you see in other parts of the country. In other parts of the country, you're seeing 10, 20, 30, 50 grand in earnest money, right? To, put, to be able to put 1% down in Metro Atlanta is virtually unheard of across the country, okay? Now, that is held by a third party, generally one of the brokers. Now, when you have a, um, the option money is basically saying, 
the buyer is willing to pay a certain number of dollars for the due, essentially for the due diligence period. Okay, so let's just say that we put out that we're willing to pay two thousand dollars for for that option. Okay, which is probably on the a little on the high side of what I would expect it to be. So the buyer then writes, a, let's say, a four thousand dollar earnest money check, or has it ready. In, 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 uh, in, hope, in hope that the deal goes under contract. And they write a $2,000 check directly to the seller. Now, if they leave the contract for any reason, that money stays with the seller, including during the due diligence period, okay? So we're starting to see this pop up a little bit as a way of standing out from the competition. This is say, I, that guy over there is asking for a due diligence period, but not paying any money for it. I'm willing to say, I don't have an intention of goofing around and leaving this deal unless we have, you know, major issues. And even if we have major issues, I'm still willing to forfeit this money. So they write a $2,000 check, let's say. And if they leave the deal for any reason, that money stays with the seller. If they stay in the deal as expected and they move towards closing, there's a checkbox that says this $2,000 or this, this um, concession, this fee will be credited to the seller or credited to the buyer at closing or will not be credited to the buyer at closing. So just based on the fact that I will pull my home off the market means that as a seller means that I'm going to collect this extra cash from you. And if you decide to leave the deal for any reason, whether it be a financing issue, an appraisal issue, a due diligence issue, whatever, that money is retained by the seller. So it's just more stuff you're offering the seller so that they have you know, more to work with because they've agreed to pull the home off the market to, to get on the sales tra uh, uh, transaction with you. Does it make sense? Hey, Bill, I got one more. Yes. Heard of, um, what's, is there language that you can put in that says, okay, during the due diligence period, we cannot back out and retain our earnest money other than a major issue or yeah. other than so that know? that is um that is detailed in a in, in a phraseology called the um right to request repairs so due diligence period it covers all the de all desires to leave the contract oh, okay they're inspection gotcha. related or not right to request repairs is something different that's an amendment that you can search for it in the in in the gar forms or in docusign right to request repairs now it is my impression that right to request repairs basically says like if it has a um I'm trying to think of the exact word they use uh, a material defect pretty much any inspection report is going to reveal a material defect right okay. so hey we got a roof leak or hey we got a um you know a, a air conditioning system that the temper temperature differential is not big enough or something like that right so yeah, material defect i can leave now what it's protecting again against is just somebody flat out changing their mind. So that I would say in the in order is um, due diligence period uh, in, in terms of attractiveness to a seller. Due diligence period, right to request repairs or something with the option money, okay? Now, there are other things you could do, right? You could raise the interest or you could raise the, um, earnest money, you can add an escalation clause, you can put in some option money, you can clean it up and not ask for things like home warranties and that kind of thing. Um, you, could, you could also uh, remove certain contingencies, right? Like I think I mentioned to you guys before, like if, if you don't think there's gonna be an appraisal issue or you're willing to come to the table with any shortage, then get rid of the appraisal contingency, right? Now, if you do that, the buyer, you need to put in writing what the buyer has agreed to do, right? When I bought my home, I was, you know, we were going off of old tax returns. I, I was a, I was a commission-based salesperson, right? So nothing was going to change inherently in my employment or not employment, but in my, my financials, they were going off last year's stuff, right? And I was buying within my price range, pretty well within my price range, right? And therefore I, took away my financing contingency because I was competing and I wasn't worried about a financing issue because I was working with the lender that I've worked with forever. I was well qualified and they had already assessed my package. You see what I'm saying? So there could be certain situations where you would um, release certain or not ask for certain contingencies 
because you, the person is capable of rectifying them should there be a problem. Now, if I do not get a, if I don't get a, uh, or I'm sorry, if I'm not asking for a financing contingency, I'm gonna make certain in my message to the other side, hey, just so you don't miss it, we're not asking for a financing contingency, right? You're pointing out all the things you're doing unusually. Could sense? you also say no appraisal contingency because of the multiple offers and the and the price going up? Yeah, say my my um, my buyer is prepared um, to rectify any low appraisal issues that might come come about. Okay. Right. Um, and then I, you know, I usually had some fun with it. I just say, hey, Michael, I, I just want to win. What's it going to take to win? I don't want to lose something to Dom over some, some, you know, this person wants to close three days before me. So if it's something real small, will you just give me a call? Because I can make a little change like that. You know, I just want them to know who I am. I don't want to be the guy. Yep. I don't want to be the guy who um, is just one of the offers. I want to be representing I want the the listing agent to go to the seller when they're you know explaining all these offers and say that one is represented by an awesome agent because the seller again is he wants or she wants it to be easy make it easy for me okay make it easy sign that one Woo, bill's a winner see what i'm saying all right you guys let's call it a morning um, I appreciate everyone, and um, uh, I'm excited to see y'all's numbers for the first week in February. Hint, hint, and I'll see you soon. Thanks, Thanks Bill. Thanks, Bill.